thank you very much for the invitation. Um, but also, uh, thank you very much for the first, uh, the, the previous uh, talks. Um, they were very interesting, excellent uh, presentations. Um, and we'd like to uh, continue now with um, the presentation on how to deal with uh, scientific misconduct. Uh, my name is Melanie Rudenhang, and along with uh, me, Michael Seidel will speak during this presentation. We're not starting from the bottom and explain everything uh, regarding research misconduct, but we rather uh, focus in particular on three things. Um, after a brief introduction, um, the real first thing is um, numbers that give us an idea of how widespread different kinds of misconduct are among different disciplines. The second is examples that show us what a case of scientific misconduct looks like and what consequences are. And the third is an, uh, is an overview of uh, how publishers, universities, corporations, and also individuals react to scientific misconduct. Let's start with uh, an introduction here. Um, in this very first part, we want to briefly introduce the three main types of misconduct to you so that we're all on the same page for the reminder of this presentation. So there's plagiarism, data falsification, image manipulation. With each of these types, it is not necessar necessarily easy to determine whether somebody intentionally deceived or whether it was an honest error that led to suspicion. It could also be that uh, some decision makers deem a case more severe than others. For example, some consider particular matching words plagiarism, while others argue that the same set of words is so, um, so commonly used in a particular context that uh, one cannot consider that plagiarism. And now let's look into this first issue of plagiarism. Um, plagiarism involves copying and reusing intellectual content of any kind without giving a proper reference, so that's the key here. And this could be text, but also video, audio, and images. In the end, it means that somebody pretends to have created something that really somebody else created. And one challenge is to determine whether somebody plagiarized if they honestly claim that they were not aware of any other source where the same or very similar content can be found, only predating the content in question. And the second type of misconduct here is probably the one most interesting to the audience here today. This is about falsifying data, which means manipulating or fabricating research data or results in an illegitimate, illegitimate manner. So what makes it illegitimate? The complex answer lies behind the definitions of different disciplines. But mainly something can easily become illegitimate if a change in the data or results is made but not openly documented. Uh, this could include deleting outliers or adding data points without making it obvious or also changing data. Um, some may associate the term data with numbers and otherwise quantitative research output, but data may well be interview transcripts and technically those could be manipulated as well. Okay, so image manipulation, strictly speaking, is a subtype of data falsification. But since it is such a vast field on its own, it's usually addressed separately. Images, after all, tend to represent data and results in research. And in that, they can be cropped or parts of an image can be erased without making the change obvious. Um, the boundaries are defined field by field. Um, just as a side note, also here, um, image manipulation is also a topic outside of academia such as in photo contests where juries judge to what extent um, certain post-processing activities, for example, using Photoshop, are legitimate. But this is not our topic here today. We're focused on, focusing on the uh, academic side. And with that, I would like to um, enter part two of the presentation about misconduct in numbers and cases. Um, for this part, we want to give you an idea of how far the problem goes and how many issues there are uh, with research misconduct. For that, we took a look at the Retraction Watch database. Maybe some of you have heard of this uh, already. Retraction Watch is also a blog where the founders, Adam Marcus and even Aransky, collect and write about of research misconduct, ranging from plagiarism over image manipulation to broad data falsification issues in general. 
And what you can see here in the screenshot is uh, the web page of the database with an exemplary search. We have a couple of options here to specify a search. And um, for this presentation in particular, we want to give an overview of how often certain kinds of reasons for retraction occurred in various disciplines. So we use the fields here. You can see this uh, reasons for retraction subjects. And to the right, you can also see and we made a selection for retraction where we can specify the nature of the notice. Other uh, kinds of nature of the notice would be um, expression of concern or correction. The reasons for retraction in, uh, and the disciplines are not search terms that we came up uh, with on our own. Um, this is terms from the classification in the database. And uh, there are, in fact, 99 different reasons for retraction in this classification. I counted them like two weeks ago and an elaborate list of, of disciplines or subdisciplines. Um, you can also see the results in this picture with the most essential information included in different columns. So in the first columns, for example, you can see here on um, the retraction, the title, subjects, the journal, the publishers or affiliations and also interesting here, um, I was talking about the blog earlier. You can see here a URL to a potential accompanying uh, retraction watch blog post. Um, the blog post then would explain the entire or at least a part of the story behind the retraction. And uh, so wh whatever information is available, you can find here. Um, other details listed include, for example, a DOI to the original article in question and what kind of article this is. So why are we showing you this? Um, retractions represent uncovered issues of any kind with research integrity, and the amount of retractions for whatever reason gives us an estimate of how much error or intentional deceit is potentially going on in a particular field. So before talking about how this kind of uh, misconduct is being handled, it is important to understand the range of the problem by quantifying it. Counting retractions is our exemplary measure for quantifying in this case. So which categories did we look at? We looked at data falsification, image falsification, plagiarism, manipulated uh, results and errors by using the search terms as specified on this slide. You can see this here on, uh, 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 in the right column. As I said, this is the predefined terms from the database classification. In order to define what we mean by these issues, we combine search terms using Boolean uh, operators. For the first example here, you can see this. Uh, if you want data falsification, we combined falsification fabrication of data or falsification fabrication of results. As you also can see here, we um, combined at least two uh, search terms for, for each category. As for the disciplines, we decided to put our emphasis on those fields that are likely to matter most for the audience of the symposium. Since it is hosted by the Center of Infection Biology and Immunity, we included biology and medicine especially, but also a few other fields for comparison, which uh, you can see on the next slide in just a second. Um, you may wonder why you see biology in a few different variations here. This is because we anticipate various ways of classification in the database. Disciplines are not always unitary in their definitions and boundaries. Medicine may include biological aspects and hence retracted articles that are biological in their nature. Just to give you an example. Um, so we search for biology and medicine together, but also for a biology excluding medicine or bio excluding medicine, since that would yield those results that come from a field that is called, for example, biochemistry. And these are the fields we mainly included for comparison and therefore summarized. Um, the retraction which database categorizes the humanities um, with all the disciplines you can see here, including architecture, several arts fields, um, historical fields, journalism, philosophy, and religion. Um, you can also see the, the disciplines that retraction would categorize to belong to the social sciences. Uh, we deliberately looked at sociology separately to have an idea of this vast subfield um, among the social sciences and 
Uh, the last entry here, in case you don't know who Diedrich Stapel is, uh, we will tell you about him in just a moment when we get to the examples. Okay, but before we look at the data, be warned that these numbers are subject to almost constant change. The numbers we present you today may well be um, have been updated since we collected them between the 20th and 24th of August. This is because, and you can see this here from this quote, um, the Retraction Watch team update both the categorization as well as the entries per category. All right, so let's begin with the first set of disciplines and combinations of uh, different uh, disciplinary boundaries. The five columns for each discipline um, you can see here represent the five reasons for retraction we defined earlier. So data falsification will be the very first column. Then comes um, image falsification, plagiarism, manipulated results and errors. And you can also see a reminder for these uh, categories above the, the, the data here um, at the top of the chart. Um, and now Michael Seal will tell you a bit more about the data that we have collected. Okay. Um, you can see the data. It's a little bit small perhaps on your screen, but you can see some of the results here. Um, medicine has um, a fairly high amount of plagiarism. Uh, that's not a good thing. It may have to do with people who are not native speakers of English looking for uh, text that they can use. Uh, plagiarism isn't necessarily someone deliberately taking content. It can also be mistakes that people make in, in copying too much. Uh, so I don't want to make too much of that. Uh, we'll talk a bit about that more. The data fabrication is actually a much more serious issue. One of the uh, other categories that is that is fairly serious is uh, uh, manipulated results and errors. Uh, there are a lot of errors. Naturally, in any kind of lab research, you're going to make mistakes. Uh, trying to titrate some very small amount is, is a tricky thing. And it's not unexpected, but it does show some error rates here. When you get down to some of the errors we tried to separate, for example, uh, biology out from medicine, uh, they're actually fairly similar here. Uh, when we're taking a look at some of the, the comparisons, as we will in the next slide, you will see quite different numbers. So let's go to the next slide. We have here computer science. And other than plagiarism, there's relatively little trouble there. Uh, there's a certain transparency in the data uh, that I think helps here. Uh, we didn't include mathematics, but mathematics is virtually zero. We have, once again, in chemistry, some fairly high error rates. Again, lab work, uh, that can be a problem. We also have some data falsification, but we don't know to what degree that data falsification, again, could be inadvertent. Physics, the data issue drops radically, and I believe one of the reasons for that is the degree to which physics has very large open data sets. Um, Kati was talking earlier about the importance of making data available, and I think this is a sign of why that really matters. Uh, the humanities, uh, you can see plagiarism is an issue, but most of the other areas here have relatively uh, few problems. One of the reasons for the higher numbers on data falsification in uh, social sciences is indeed Diedrich Stoppel. You can see his category there. And we're going to talk about Diedrich Stoppel and what he did in just a moment. So let's go to Diedrich Stoppel. This is an image that we used in an exhibition in the University Library at Humboldt Universität zu Berlin. Uh, Stoppel was really successful, um, a charming man, successful social psychologist, um, but he began inventing data. And he explains at some point, he's, he's been very open once he was caught, uh, that publishers, editors didn't like all the complexity of explanations why these numbers weren't quite perfect and why that didn't quite work. 
he realized he could make a much better case if he had his own data that he made up. And I'm going to read to you uh, a quote from Schnabel. This is from my book. I hold up book so that you can see uh, that I, I quote in here. And it's specifically about the image that you're seeing on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, here's what he was doing to get a behavioral measure of discrimination related to stereotyping. Travelers were asked to fill out a short questionnaire in an area where there were six chairs lined up. Respondents who were all Caucasians could choose any chair except that first chair in the row, which was already taken by either a black Dutch African or white Dutch Caucasian Confederate. Through random assignment, half of the participants for this uh, in this Confederate were 20 year old male Dutch African black persons. And for the other half, the Confederate was a 20 year old male Dutch Caucasian white person. Pre-tests had shown that these two confederations, Confederates were judged equally intelligent, friendly, attractive, and approachable. The dependent variable was the distance in the number of chairs, zero to four, between the chair with the Confederate and the chair the participants chose to set in. This sounds wonderfully plausible, right? I mean, it's a good story, it's a good setup, but it wasn't true. He didn't do it. Um, he writes a little later, and this is quoted in an article by uh, Banerjee, uh, on his return trip from Tilburg stop, stop, stopped at the train station in Utrecht. This was the site of his study linking racism to environmental untidiness, supposedly, um, conducted during a strike by sanitation workers. Now looking around at the rush hour and the people streamed in and off the platforms, he could not find the location that matched the conditions described in his experiment. So he did a good story. He did a really good story. It was a good enough story that it convinced editors, it convinced peer reviewers. It just wasn't true. And that's something to remember, don't, I hope none of you are, are taking this as a lesson in how to do falsification. Uh, but what you need to realize is this kind of data can be passed on to you. Um, Stapel gave the fake data to his doctoral students. Uh, it was in fact a couple of doctoral students who began to have doubt that this data was so perfect and talked to the authorities at the university which took an enormous amount of courage, and Gestapo was found out. You may also encounter situations, and I'm going to talk about Jim Hunton later on. He passed fake data on to any number of really high profile colleagues who believed him. The data looked good, but they were simply lies. When you take data from someone, the lesson here is have a look, insist on the original data, insist on being able to see it. Then you will know whether it's fake or not. Stoppel couldn't have, didn't have any actual data to show. Let's go on to the next slide and Melanie will talk about that. Yes, uh, this is a case about uh, Mark Hauser who was um, a professor at Harvard University. He worked in fields such as psychology and evolutionary biology. For example, one of his goals was to compare monkeys to humans. And for that, he worked with different kinds of monkeys. One species he worked with was the so-called um, cotton top tamarind monkeys. At the beginning here, um, so Charles Gross, and uh, you can find the full reference on our reference slide, um, who wrote a lengthy piece about Hauser's case of scientific misconduct for the nation in 2011, uh, makes an important remark about this. Um, he says that, and I quote, Hauser's laboratory was virtually the only one in the world working on cognition and tamarinds, which made replication of his work almost impossible. End of quote. Um, this is core factor in, in this case and uh, in general in detecting scientific misconduct. So let's keep that in mind for, for a moment. Um, 
Gross in, in his article also explains what happened to Hauser, namely in one of his experiments, Hauser tested whether tamarind monkeys reacted to a change of sound patterns. So a reaction is said to indicate cognitive capabilities that these kinds of animals are not known to have, um, which might put them on a similar, similar level with humans. So experiments like this were videotaped and uh, reactions of the animals were recorded by more than one researcher without knowing which sound pattern was played at a particular time. Um, but the problem that arose in Hauser's research lab was that his research assistants did not agree with what Hauser himself claimed to have seen in the video. Um, Hauser's results were skewed to prove a visible reaction by the monkeys, while his research assistants did not see that same reaction. So two opinions stood against each other. Um, on the one hand, it may be true in some cases that this is up to interpretation, and in fact, human impression reactions are hard to quantify. On the other hand, however, in, in Hauser's case, um, a graduate student and a research assistant in the lab re-evaluated the videotapes behind his back, so without Hauser knowing it. But they did not manage to yield the same results, so the, the results that Hauser claimed to have found. And this set Lewis a round of suspicion. And in the end, uh, the researchers in the lab reported uh, the case to the university. And after investigations, Hauser was found guilty of scientific misconduct by the Office of Research Integrity. And the main problem, as becomes evident in the report, was not full fabrication of data, but changing data in a way that would give him the results that he wanted. So what happened to him? Uh, Hauser had uh, resigned from his position at Harvard University in 2011. At that point uh, in time, he had neither admitted that he committed research misconduct, nor did he say that he did not. Um, three years after his resignation, Retraction Watch reports on two of his new publications, both in a, in a psychology journal. He even published a book in 2013. There is, in fact, only one single retraction listed for Mark Hauser in the Retraction Watch database, the one that you saw earlier, namely the one um, 2002 article about the cotton top uh, tamarind monkeys. So this case stresses the meaning of interpreting data and the responsibility that comes with that. But it also shows us how important it is to have a collective of researchers doing the interpretation in order to avoid errors and blunt misconduct. So I think that's that's the main message for this case here. Michael, would you like to go on with the next case? Yes, one is particularly relevant for people in the biological sciences. Uh, if misidentified cells, uh, in contaminated cells, in effect, that were discovered uh, at the University of Washington. And, you know, we all share uh, data, we all share cells, which are a form of data. They were passed around uh, from one lab to another. And uh, if the 2015 statistic is correct, there could be 5,800 articles that actually had results based on this data, which these, these cells, which may have been false. Uh, no one was trying to create false data. Uh, if you're in the biological sciences, I am sure you realize how difficult it is to maintain the right kind of conditions to have um, the cells be, be uh, uncontaminated, perfect. And I'm sure you also realize how difficult it is sometimes to identify cells. Um, back in about 2004, I worked with a person who did animal biology, who uh, taught his students about how to identify cell types using an expert system that someone wrote at that time uh, in Australia. And he felt this was very successful. It's not uh, an artificial intelligent type system that simply looks at things and gives you answers. It was using human judgment, human eyes, and giving essentially advice to people. But you need to use some sort of tools when you get data, including 
cells as data from other researchers so that you can be reasonably sure that what you've got is actually really uh, the, the, the uncontaminated cells that you expect. No one is guilty. We're not talking about someone who did something deliberate, but we are talking about a very widespread kind of problem. And what we want to talk with you about in, in this section three is how people deal with the, the integrity problems that we've been showing you. And of course, one of the first groups we want to talk about are publishers. Uh, I have 20 years of experience as, a, as an editor. And uh, one of the things that I insisted on as editor was that I send papers through a plagiarism checker such as Authenticate. Authenticate is a, is a very high quality uh, piece of software looking at a very high quality database. And the, the publisher was not deeply enthused about spending the money to do this, but it actually meant the rate of, of plagiarism in the journal was virtually zero. Uh, there is an interesting case that came up more recently where some plagiarism was discovered uh, that a co-author came from a um, developing country and uh, had copied some things from a presentation that he had seen at a conference thinking it was okay to do that because he didn't think it was published. Uh, it was in fact plagiarism after some considerable discussion with the publisher the main author was actually not guilty. He he had no idea this this person had written something that was wrong. And indeed, the the person who did it was not entirely guilty because he didn't understand the rules. Uh, do you take away? Do you just retract a paper like that? Uh, we came up with a compromise where there could be a revision, uh, where the problematic parts were labeled or taken out. Uh, and the, the paper remained because the core of the paper had interesting information in it. Not all publishers are willing to do that. And publishers really hate these kinds of situations because it costs an enormous amount of time and effort to look at the details and to decide what you're going to do. So let's, let's go back to the peer review issue here. Uh, serious. Uh, scientific journals, and I'm using scientific in the uh, German and French sense, meaning all forms of uh, Wissenschaft. Uh, in English, as I think many of you know, uh, scientific just really refers to natural science uh, ever since basically the beginning of the 20th century. But I will use it in the more German sense here. Every scientific publisher is, is using peer review. Uh, peer review is, is difficult too. You've got to find the right people, you find the right experts to do it. Uh, they are humans. They, they don't necessarily have a lot of time to spend looking at things. And they certainly, almost certainly are not going to look at the data. They're going to take a look at whether the arguments are logical. They may possibly redo some of the analysis, but they probably don't have an opportunity for that. So peer review really is still the best thing we have, but it's not a good barrier. And, and publishers especially admit they can't, a peer review can't prevent fake data. Um, manipulated images, they can, there can be some special checking, but peer reviewers mostly can't discover uh, manipulated images as well. What do we do about this? There is a lot of interest in open peer review. And open peer review has its pluses and minuses. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about it. There will continue to be a lot of discussion. Uh, the best open peer review still has people who are selected on the basis of their, their expertise to look at an article, to do a proper analysis, but it lets others have a look at the article as well. 
the forms of open peer review that are simply opened up to the general public. And if there are two or three people who say, yes, this looks fine, consider it published, are uh, not really serious forms of peer review. What I would like to make a, an argument in favor of here are the preprint servers. And I'm using an example, SSRN, um, the archive at Cornell is one, and there are a number of others. SSRN and the archive are the most established. Um, I have asked for some information from the owner of SSRN, which is Elsevier, about how often papers that are published there end up having problems with integrity. And I think the number of those is relatively small. We certainly know that to be true from the archive. Um, what is published in SSRN are fairly uh, often uh, heavily mathematical economic uh, papers. And the more mathematical a paper is, and the more open the data sets are, the better you can check. But that may also be a, uh, a way of addressing some of the problems. Let's go on to the next slide. Universities um, really hate to face the problem of a, uh, an integrity violation. Um, I have a decade of experience with this from uh, my own university, uh, from my, my leading the commission, and I'm still involved in as advisor. Uh, it's difficult for us often to know whether an accusation is true. Uh, and one of the things that we have done at Humboldt University Zibelin that others don't necessarily do is to have a commission that has a very broad set of people from the natural sciences as well as from the humanities and social sciences and people at several different um, status levels, that is professors and, and mitarbeiter as well, so that we get a, a reasonably broad set of people with some expertise. Nonetheless, sometimes you have to go outside. The, the social embarrassment for a university is considerable. Universities um, try not to advertise that people have committed a problem. Uh, there are a couple of things a university traditionally can do. Uh, if there is an accusation about a doctoral degree, uh, it can be retracted. Um, in the case of Diedrich Stoppel that we looked at a little earlier, where the doctoral students received uh, fake data and they wrote their theses on the basis of fake data, the university made a very reasonable uh, decision that it was not their fault. They, the, the, they of course, faced the problem that the data uh, meant their results were worthless, but they kept their degrees. Um, it is very rare that someone gets fired because of a, an integrity problem. Um, it's a little less rare today than it was before. Uh, it's particularly rare at German universities, uh, but it does, it does happen. So there are some very serious risks here. One of the issues that we face uh, when we are looking at this socially and institutionally is what other options do we have? Um, a reprimand, a revision is uh, certainly a, a possibility. And Frau Giffey, uh, who was accused of plagiarism uh, and the, the Free University made a very reasonable decision again to, to uh, go with a reprimand. Let me say um, at the risk of, of running over a bit in time here, Plagiarism is difficult. Uh, we have Vraniplog, which takes a look at German dissertations in particular that are open access and available. Their definitions are very clear, but their definitions are not necessarily the definitions that every um, Dr. Vater would use or Dr. Butter, and not ones that are necessarily widely accepted. Let's go on to the next slide. Corporations find integrity problems particularly difficult to deal with. 
Uh, it has a big impact on their marketing uh, and can undermine uh, their economics considerably. They don't actually often have very good internal mechanisms for how to uh, discover where the problems were. It is not unusual that they will go too far in terms of firing people and they don't have good investigative mechanisms. Uh, this is something that needs improvement. Some corporations obviously do a better job than others. Uh, those of you who are working for a corporation need to realize you're probably at more risk if you are accused of some kind of integrity violation of losing a job there unless you can really prove that you're not involved with the problem. And this is really a slide for those who might be accused of some kind of integrity violation. Uh, what are your options? That's one of the key questions. Um, but actually, I remember, um, I, I forgot to say one thing, and I want to go back um, two slides, Melanie. Uh, back to universities. Uh, so I, I want to mention the case of Jim Hunton here. Uh, Jim also shared his data. He falsified data, um, and he shared it with any number of colleagues. And it was discovered because an editor, again, asked for the data. What happened to him and what happened to his colleagues? Uh, when his university opened an investigation, uh, Jim Hunton first tried denying it, and then he vanished. He simply left. No one knows where he is now. The university looked at his computer. He had run binary zero program over it to delete every piece of data. But I, I trust you all know that you can't really delete data in this modern world. Um, I know Kati suggests that you, you delete data when you've anonymized it so you don't have it. That doesn't happen work. It doesn't actually work. The data can be recovered. And what they discovered is he had been making up uh, in spreadsheets the whole of the set <coughs> data. Uh, the people with whom he shared the data, major researchers, suffered major embarrassment, they did not lose their jobs because they could explain it. This came from one source. We have another case here, uh, a recent case in the medical world where researchers took data uh, from a company in California. They had no reason to doubt that this data was made up, uh, was uh, not true. It turned out it was purely uh, fictional and uh, this has led to retractions in some very prestigious journals, such as Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine. The lesson here that you really need to think about is check your data. Be sure it's real. Be sure it has come from a safe source. So let's go back to the slide I was talking on before. What do you do if someone accuses you? Someone says, I think you have committed a violation and I'm taking this to the university authorities. And I'm going to assume that you haven't done it. Um, I hope you don't, please don't. But if this happens to you, it's very hard sometimes to deal with the reactions. And there's social and psychological consequences you're going to have. You need to recognize this. What you need to do, what I would recommend you do, is to get a friend, get a colleague, to look at your data, look at the case with you, and to think about how you will formulate your defense. The accusations can come in a number of ways. If it's plagiarism, take a look at where the text actually came from that you're accused of taking and what the circumstances are. Uh, sometimes, for example, uh, paraphrasing is an issue. 
you should always have a full reference when you paraphrase. You shouldn't take too many of the words, but paraphrasing is at least an explanation. I paraphrase that. Maybe my quotations were insufficient. My reference was insufficient, but that's a reason. That's something to work with. Uh, if you have made a mistake in data, admit the mistake. Get someone to advise you. In the end, you will do better to defend yourself within the institution than to go to a legal case. But if you must go to a legal case, this is not impossible. Uh, I know a number of people who have been thinking about doing this. Um, I can't obviously give you any names because this is all very confidential. Uh, it costs a lot of money to take a case to law and you are at risk sometimes that the people who are judging the case don't really understand the science. If you do get accused, if you do escape, it may well have some effect on your research too. Uh, that is unavoidable. What you want to do besides not getting an accusation uh, is to be very careful when you continue research to avoid the kinds of problems that you may have encountered before. Uh, transparency is very important. Open data is very important. And uh, over the years of dealing with many plagiarism cases, uh, you will see in my books, I've been very, very careful to quote almost everything. I hardly ever paraphrase anymore, even though my doctor father did it all the time. Uh, just because it has become much more risky in the modern world. I think that is the last of our content slides, Melanie. Yes, indeed. Um, we would like to thank you for uh, listening. And um, also, you're welcome to contact us at any time about questions. Um, you can see our contact details here. Um, but at last, I would also like to uh, go through our reference slides here to make sure this has been seen. And showing references is part of good scientific practice. Okay, that's it, so thank you.